Hello, everyone. My name is Rich Ottinger, and I'm the Marketing Programs Manager for Park Systems, coming to you from the Park Nanoscience Center at SUNY Polytechnic in Albany, New York. Welcome to the third installment of Park Systems 2019 Material Science Research and AFM webinar series. Today's presentation is titled Viscoelastic Surfactants and Oilfield Chemicals. Before we begin, let me give you a quick overview of today's session. The presentation is expected to take approximately 40 to 45 minutes which should allow us some time for a question and answer period at the end. If you click the uh, raise your hand button at that time, I can unmute your line to ask a question, or if you would prefer, you may type in your questions at any time during the webinar and I will post them at the end. Any of these questions that we did not get to, we will try to address in a follow-up email. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Rigoberto Advincula. Dr. Advincula is a professor of macromolecular science and engineering at Case Western Reserve University and the Editor-in-Chief of MRS Communications. He's a Fellow of the American Chemical Society and is the author of more than 250 peer-reviewed publications. Please welcome Dr. Rigoberto Advincula. Thank you very much, Richard, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all our listeners. And uh, if you've been following the series, we've been covering a number of topics. Uh, some of them are uh, related uh, to fundamental science, Others are more technology driven, but I hope you find this series quite useful and informative. So today we're going to talk about viscoelastic surfactants, and I'm going to emphasize in particular today uh, their applications in oil field uh, chemicals. So Case Western Reserve University, I'm a professor at Macromolecular Science and Engineering Department. We are a comprehensive university in Cleveland, Ohio, home of the Cleveland Museum of Art, Cleveland Orchestra, and we are near Lake Erie. And um, as a professor in macromolecular science engineering, we are focused on chemistry of polymers, and uh, in, in particular, the director of Petrocase, which is a consortium for materials for oil field um, service and petroleum engineering. So I will give a brief introduction on surface chemistry and interfacial phenomena to give an appreciation of viscoelastic surfactants and its applications. So definitely when we talk about surface tension, we are looking at the interaction, uh, adhesion and cohesive forces uh, in matter. And so some examples of nature, you will see that uh, uh, the non-wetting behavior on feathers or insects or the ability of the insect strider to seemingly walk in water, superheterophobic effect in plants and surfaces, uh, and so on. Uh, this is a consequence not only of surface energy, but the hierarchical roughness found in nature. Now, when we talk about surface and interfacial tension, we're basically looking at cohesive and adhesive forces. Cohesive forces is the force you have between similar molecules. Adhesive will be between interface of two faces, and this is normally exhibited as a surface tension found uh, in bubbles, capillarity, droplets, uh, lungs. Now, this surface tension can be measured uh, in dynes per centimeter uh, and uh, is exhibited at various temperatures. So in other words, surface tension does va uh, change as a function of temperature. Uh, we can measure them with techniques like Cecil drop method, uh, Wilhelmy plate method, um, and other types of uh, contact angle measurement devices. In particular, measuring the contact angle between surfaces uh, allows us to look at the surface tension between solid to liquid, uh, solid to air, and liquid to air, given by the Young's equation. And this allows us to characterize surface energy and wetting phenomena. Now, what modifies the surface essentially are molecules that are surface active, or surface active agents we call surfactants. And surfactants are very common commonly uh, associated with detergent, shampoo, cleaning material, but of course, uh, we cannot breathe without lungs, uh, surfactants in our lungs, 
and of course surfactants found in the cell membrane. But chemically, we classify them based on the head group, uh, anionic, nanionic, cationic, or amphalytic surfactants, or even polymer surfactants. So some common examples uh, would be your sodium dodecyl sulfate, an anionic surfactant, uh, CTAB, cetramethyl ammonium uh, bromide is a cationic surfactant, uh, and uh, they uh, can be characterized or quantified by measuring what we call the hydrophilic lipophilic balance or HLB balance. And they can be oriented uh, anisotropically, let's say between the air and water interface or oil and water interface. Now, a very common term that we associate with uh, the association of surfactants uh, is the term micelles. Uh, micelles uh, are often thought to be spherical, but actually micelles are quite dynamic in that they form or reform uh, or exchange between a micellar structure and the uh, matrix environment or matrix fluid. We measure them by looking at what we uh, normally do with properties like surface tension or break in light scattering or conductivity giving us a value called the critical micelle concentration or CMC. The CMC is important because this denotes the concentration or the minimum concentration by which a micelle is observed. As I mentioned, micelles are dynamic systems. Uh, we call the single uh, surfactants as unimers. And then when they uh, come together in micelles or aggregates, okay, they then form or reform uh, uh, in uh, a variety of environments that are both temperature and pressure dependent. Now, micelles uh, can be characterized by geometry, the presence of salt or concentration or even temperature. So we would say a typical micelle would be spherical or even ellipsoidal in shape, but as you change the critical packing parameter, they can go from cylindrical to inverted micelles. Of course, with concentration, they can form vesicles, uh, where like micelles, which is the subject of our talk today on viscoelastic surfactants, or they can form lipid bilayers as such that you would find in membranes. The micellar shape and uh, surfactant geometry can be given by the uh, size of the head group, the volume of the tail or the, or the output chain and a critical chain length. So as, as for a spherical micelle with n number of surfactants, you can characterize the volume and the outer, outer, outer area. And by understanding the role of the critical par, par, packing parameter, you can predict the uh, micelle and uh, uh, vesicle behavior of these uh, surfactants. As shown in this diagram, a typical uh, lipid will then have a measurable critical parameter uh, with values of uh, one third or less than one third, between one third and one half, or one half to one and greater than one. And this is characterized by a cone, a truncated cone or wedge, a truncated cone, a cylinder, or an inverted micelle giving an inverted. So in other words, the size of the head group, the volume of the alkyl chain, the length of the alkyl chain eventually determines whether you form a micelle, cylindrical micelle, or a vesical bilayer. Uh, as you can see here, uh, these different liquid crystalline shapes or lyotrophic phases play an important role in um, changing not only the surface tension, but the viscoelastic behavior of the host liquid. And uh, for example, uh, in a monolayer, uh, such as a Langmuir blodgett film or Langmuir film, one can orient this uh, artificially uh, in a directed assembly as opposed to a self-assembly that you'll find in this uh, phase behavior. So that means you can characterize them with a phase diagram uh, that can be represented by a change in concentration versus temperature. 
essentially the critical micelle concentration as shown by this dotted line here represents the uh, division between unimers and the micellar structure. And as you increase the concentration of the amplifile, they go from micelles to cylindrical to lamellar in uh, structure. And a temperature change uh, represents what we call a craft temperature, a temperature by which below uh, it, there are no micelle or uh, lamellar structures observed, but above, this temperature or craft temperature, you will observe these different lyotrophic phases. Uh, to differentiate uh, micelles in water in the absence of another phase or fluid, uh, we typically reserve the term emulsion or micro emulsions uh, in the presence of another media. Let's say oil and water can be separated by a surfactant or emulsifier forming an emulsion. An emulsion essentially forms a stable phase between the oil and water only in the presence of a surfactant. And a uh, small enough size, but still uh, approaching that of an equilibrium uh, can be referred to a micro emulsion or even a nano emulsion uh, and are regarded to be thermi thermodynamically stable. So emulsions can be clear or opaque depending on the size of the particle or colloid. And here you can see that a phase diagram actually can be constructed between that of the oil and water phase and the concentration of the surfactant, giving you again of micellar, cylindrical, uh, and bicontinuous phases depending on their position in the phase diagram. So overall, surfactants is the key towards observing these different mesophases uh, in solution. Are they real? Yes, they are, because one can observe them by techniques like transmission electron microscopy. Uh, in a cryo-TEM, as shown in this image, you can actually see the spherical micelles and vesicles, or even multilamellar vesicles forming an onion onion-like structure as shown below. Uh, here are further examples of uh, detergency where the uh, micelles and the uh, vesicles are formed uh, on the surface of, let's say, a fabric. So SEM is a very good technique. However, to actually see the molecular orientation and packing of this as films, Atomic force microscopy imaging is a good technique. So for example, the study of uh, lipid bilayers or surface, uh, surface supported lipid bilayers, let's say in a flat surface like mica, can actually be observed uh, uh, by atomic force microscopy where you can characterize the morphology and at the same time use the cantilever tip to measure some of the viscoelastic properties of the material. So in other words, AFM is a surface probe technique that allows you not only imaging, but the physical property uh, characteristics of the film itself. Uh, one technique, for example, the langmuir blodgett film technique is a good way to trap these phases at different uh, uh, isotherms of uh, surface pressure isotherms as shown here, where one can kinetically trap these different phases and again, uh, observe them by atomic force microscopy as it transitions from a gaseous to liquid to liquid expanded phase uh, uh, and deposited, let's say, on a flat surface like mica or even a um, highly ordered pyrolytic graphite. Uh, here you can see a C-tab as a surfactant that has been deposited on mica, looking at their homogeneous uh, uh, layer formation. And at the same time, you can go to the atomic resolution uh, of uh, C-tab that has been well ordered in a substrate uh, like HOPG or highly ordered pyrolytic graphite. In other words, uh, AFM is actually a key technique towards the study of surfactants. So with this, let us go and discuss viscoelastic surfactants. What are viscoelastic surfactants? Well, uh, these are essentially micelles, 
where if you go beyond the CMC and even beyond the CMC, you go to concentrations anywhere from one to 15% by weight or very high concentration. The micelles will tend to form cylinders. These cylinders will then be elongated, uh, forming a network structure uh, that uh, tries to uh, random walk or avoid uh, each cylinder, forming a worm-like micelle. The consequence actually is observed as an increase or a dramatic increase in viscosity. Hence the term viscoelastic surfactants. So these surfactants, uh, either by influence of pH or counter ions, uh, tend to increase the viscous viscosity of the liquid by which they form, uh, forming a gel-like behavior. So surfactant molecules then at a high concentration means that they are able to influence the viscosity buildup resulting in a gel. And as you'll see later in oil field chemical applications, this is quite important because they can replace the role of polymers in hydraulic fracturing, completion fluids, and even uh, matrix acidizing procedures. That is, these viscoelastic surfactants can have advantages in that once you are done with their intended application, you can easily break them down by um, dilution or the use of breakers, and they will simply reform back to their individual surfactants or smaller micelles or break down the cylindrical phases. In other words, uh, there's a lot of surface chemistry here uh, that can be applied uh, not only in hydraulic fracturing, but uh, techniques like enhanced oil recovery as well. So why does a viscoelastic surfactant form? Well, first of all, uh, they have a concentration, a higher concentration that tends to form the, force them not only uh, forming a vesicle, a, uh, a spherical vesicle, but actually elongated cylinders and worm-like micelles. So there's a concentration factor. However, there is also the role of the critical packing parameter. So a critical parameter less than one third uh, prevents it from forming a cylindrical micelle and tends to keep it in a spherical micellar form. However, a critical parameter between one third to one half causes or eases the ability to form the cylindrical micelles. Hence, not all surfactants are capable of forming viscoelastic surfactants. Now in a viscoelastic surfactant, uh, there are as well dynamic factors that are shown in terms of formation and reformation of the spherical micelles. As you can see on the transmission electron microscopy image, uh, these are highly elongated, uh, worm-like looking, hence the term worm-like micelles, and they are stable. And uh, uh, in a, another life or another manifestation, instead of forming worm-like micelle, uh, it is also uh, able to form vesicles. In other words, the hierarchy of structures or lyotropic structures uh, can either form a spherical micelle, a vesicular micelle, or a worm-like micelle. Viscoelastic elastic surfactants, uh, by their nature uh, in terms of the change in viscosity, are limited to the use of, of worm-like micelles. So with increasing concentration uh, and uh, increasing changes in the uh, packing parameter, then you can form or reform micelles. And the length as well increases with increasing concentration as shown uh, in, directly in this the, uh, micrograph. And that means that the uh, surfactant or control of the surfactant uh, stability is important for their uh, eventual uh, worm-like uh, micelle formation. So at this point, uh, let us talk about uh, viscoelastic surfactants as observed. Uh, in uh, applications such, such as oil field chemistry. So as a review, uh, you will uh, know that uh, oil and gas 
or the petroleum industry is dependent in um, the upstream in terms of generation of uh, the extracted fluids, uh, namely oil or gas. And uh, in the oil and gas industry, we call this the upstream part of the production. What we call uh, refining, chemical refining, cracking is part of the downstream process. And hence, uh, viscoelastic surfactants are very important for the extraction or the upstream side of things. In uh, another manifestation, let's say with the uh, uh, hard to reach oil or tertiary recovery, we have a procedure called EOR or enhanced oil recovery. So in short, the EC oil can be recovered uh, in as uh, its natural pressure. We call this primary recovery. Or in secondary recovery, where you apply uh, simple water flooding or other types of uh, productivity enhancement methods, uh, it's secondary recovery. The tertiary recovery is the harder uh, method in that uh, this hard to reach oil or gas uh, needs increased pressure or increased permeability. Uh, in fact, the term hydraulic fracturing, which is the introduction of the hydraulic fracturing fluid together with uh, propat sands, is designed to increase uh, oil recovery in the tertiary manner or unconventional fields where uh, the pressure uh, is not enough to force the oil, let's say in a low uh, Darcy permeability shale uh, formation. Hence, shale oil and gas uh, is associated with hydraulic fracturing. So in hydraulic fracturing, you actually force the liquid to crack or fracture the uh, shale formation together with a procedure called vertical, I mean, horizontal or directional uh, drilling, the combination of the two actually is the key driver to which the uh, oil and gas production in the U.S. has dramatically uh, jumped. So what it means is that you need a viscosified fluid, or sometimes we call them slick water. Uh, essentially, this viscosified fluid can be fulfilled by adding, let's say, a viscosifying polymer uh, to force not only the uh, fracture to occur, but also to float or to introduce the sand particles or propans that are then lodged or embedded uh, with the fractures that are as far as uh, several miles uh, deep uh, from the ground or the pad. And that means that you need uh, this viscosity control or effective viscosity control to deliver that pressure or, or pump them uh, through the well. As you can see here, these highly viscosified fluids uh, are gels, essentially gels uh, that are designed so that they do not damage the uh, fracture. They enhance productivity. They have good friction behavior uh, when you pump them down the well. In other words, hydraulic fracturing fluids are chemical formulations designed to optimize the introduction of the hydraulic pressure on the uh, fracture as well as deliver the propane. Now, a typical composition of hydraulic uh, fracturing fluid will be, of course, be the water media, and then you will have their uh, inhibitors, pH adjusters, breakers, cross-linkers, corrosion inhibitors, biocide, etc. But the most important ingredient there is the presence of polymers. So these polymers can be in the form of cellulose polymers or starch, santan gum, uh, but these days the industry uses mostly polyacrylamide. And uh, there are advantages and disadvantages of this uh, polymers. One is they can give you a heavy residue or breakdown products that are hard to remove from the well. 
They tend to also reduce the permeability of the propan pack, and they do degrade over time. And sometimes they have poor temperature performance. Hence, polymers are good, uh, but not ideal uh, as a viscosifying media in hydraulic fracturing. Now, a viscoelastic surfactant introduced in hydraulic fracturing fluid is not new in the sense that they have been several patents or uh, patented applications and, uh, of course, commercial availability of these fluids. So a viscoelastic surfactant uh, has the advantage that it can be easily recovered. Uh, you, uh, the, you do not require gel breakers, as in the case of santan gum and other polymeric materials. One way to uh, uh, basically break them is to dilute them. They're easily and efficiently transported uh, as, as surfactants that can be concentrated upon introduction to the pad. Uh, they are easily and efficiently transport propans with a lower, even with a lower viscosity. Uh, they tend to have reduced uh, energy for the pumping operation, better geometry control, you can reach deeper formation and they leave little residue or reduce the amount of residue in a gravel pack, preventing, for example, formation damage. So what is the reason why VES and polymer gels are, are, are competitive or different? Well, uh, the one major reason that viscoelastic surfactants are not used as widely as, po as polymers is price or cost. Uh, they are more expensive than polymers. However, in certain types of projects or jobs, uh, they are ideal or even the only type of viscosifying media that can work. Uh, viscoelastic surfactants uh, are, are able to control the infer, in, interfacial transition and the viscosity of the injected fluids. Unlike polymers, as I mentioned, VES, are not permanently degraded by high shear, but rather you can recover them as surfactants or even reuse them. Uh, they also um, are uh, more amenable to uh, different types of additives in terms of performance, either with acids, uh, matrix acidizing procedures, or different brine conditions. Hence, VES can have advantages and disadvantages, but one of the biggest barriers, uh, of course, is cost or price. Now, it's been demonstrated, and some of this uh, comes from companies like Schlumberger or um, Baker Hughes uh, and other companies that supply them, uh, like uh, Axel Nobel or even um, uh, Stepan. They, are, as in many projects, have shown to have better permeability and they have uh, better transfer efficiency, not only with uh, reducing the energy, uh, pumping energy to introduce them uh, to the fluid, but also in terms of shear thinning behavior. Uh, in several studies, and these uh, were taken from Slumberger uh, literature, I should have put here, uh, the Slumberger acknowledgement, uh, they have actually been shown to increase productivity uh, on the at least at the beginning of the well life over polymer fluids uh, in some study cases. Uh, however, uh, uh, other types of um, uh, advantages can be seen in the increase in permeability and fracture length of the VES. In other words, they go farther and deeper compared to uh, their polymer cousins in terms of uh, ability to reach the formation. In enhanced oil recovery, uh, they have been shown to uh, reduce the interfacial transition uh, to low values. They are more tolerant to uh, uh, the formation. Uh, and they are shear thinning, as mentioned, and of course reversible, meaning you can recover them. Uh, they have also shown to have good thermal stability at higher temperatures. So in a couple of studies uh, with enhanced oil recovery, uh, they uh, tend to uh, have superior performance in seeking out oil bearing channels or even blocking water channels 
uh, and therefore uh, are able to recover more. So in terms of the viscoelastic surfactant uh, properties, uh, what are some of the interesting um, properties that perhaps in the future can find use in oil field chemistry. Now, I must say that VAS is, of course, not limited to applications in the oil field, but they have been used uh, as viscosifying media in uh, uh, cosmetics, personal care, like shampoo. Uh, they have also been uh, used in certain food uh, processing as well. But perhaps uh, in other uh, uses in the future uh, for uh, delivering controlled gel-like behavior uh, in the presence of stimuli like pH, temperature, um, concentration of salts, uh, they can have interesting applications. So for example, uh, in this paper or in this work, uh, the viscoelastic behavior was controlled as a function of temperature. You can increase or decrease the temperature. This will change the stability of these micelles to form elongated uh, micellar structures. Uh, not only can they be influenced by temperature, uh, of course, salts or the ionic strength can influence their stability. Uh, normally, one would measure their viscoelastic properties with a viscometry experiment, but one can also use rheology to obtain the storage and this loss modulus of their properties as a function of concentration or even temperature. Uh, in the presence of light, photo switchable VES can result in changes in viscosity. So, for example, in this azobenzene containing surfactant complex, the counter ion uh, is essentially a azobenzene dye that can switch from the cis to the trans form. As shown here, uh, the cis form uh, forces the formation of a long worm like micelle, whereas the trans form of the uh, azobenzene results in a vesicle which has a lower viscosity. Hence, you can say that light is a trigger, in this case, for changing the viscoelastic nature, which can eventually be traced back to the nanostructure of a vesicle versus that of an elongated longworm like myself. Here is an example that a pH responsive VS fluid uh, where you have the change in the counter ion properties of the acid group to the cation. Hence, this amphoteric behavior uh, changes the viscoelastic behavior as a function of pH. And uh, that means you can go and change the pH range from 6.2 to 7.3, quite a narrow window. And you can have a dramatic change in the uh, formation of a worm-like micelle uh, as a result of a lower pH, as shown in this diagram. So decreasing the pH results in a higher viscosity. Uh, here you can see the influence of carbon dioxide gas, CO2, uh, in transitioning from a spherical to a worm-like micelle. So this particular surfactant is sensitive to the acidity of the media, resulting in uh, improve or increase stability of the worm-like micelle through the complexation of the sulfonate group and the uh, protonated uh, diamine, as shown here, resulting in a higher viscosity. And this is because of the presence of CO2, which tends to lower the solution pH by the formation of carbonic acid. And there are several other examples of VES that are pH, temperature, uh, chemically, enzymatically ex uh, um, stimuli responsive, but I will not have time to show all those examples to you. 
Uh, however, VES can also be influenced by the presence of particles, polymers, and even other um, complementary surfactants. So the worm-like uh, vesicles are stable at particular pressures and temperature. However, they can be even made more stable by the introduction of surfactants, as the, the, uh, uh, the grammatically shown here. So VES alone uh, is, is good for tight formation, high temperature, high salinities. We're talking here again about uh, their application in the oil field. However, with the presence of uh, VES and polymers together, they can uh, result in a higher viscosity fluid uh, and a polymer uh, enabling a residual viscosity upon contact with oil. Uh, another uh, improvement on VES is its combination with foam. So foamed VES gels uh, can be done, uh, be observed by the addition of cationic and anion surfactants on water, uh, increasing both viscoelastic moduli and improved leak off properties of the fluid system. In other words, uh, they can be used to prevent formation damage or uh, reduce fluid loss. In another combination, VES can be added with nanoparticles. Now, nanoparticles act as anchoring points for these worm like micelles, again, improving their temperature stability and increase their viscosity at lower surfactant concentration. So, in other words, you will less, yes, looser, less use surfactants uh, with the addition of those nanoparticles. Uh, with the addition of polymers, you have the advantage that they can introduce electrostatic and hydrophobic interactions. So in general, polymer surfactants are more stable than the small molecule surfactants. However, uh, with the presence of polymers and their association with, uh, let's say, a complementary charge surfactant, you will tend to enhance the stability of the aggregate or in increase the aggregation number. As shown here, uh, you can change the surface tension value uh, uh, and the CMC value simply by the addition of a polymer. Uh, polymer, as shown in this diagram, can force the aggregation of the surfactants uh, in a more stable manner uh, where the polymer uh, can complex with the aggregates and improve their stability versus a dynamic behavior. Uh, so in general, uh, polymers tend to increase the CMC and therefore they can affect the CMC value resulting in uh, improved performance over procedures like dispersion, flocculating, and even wetting properties. So one example of a viscoelastic surfactant as shown here with the addition of a associating polymer such as this acrylic acid uh, derivative results in uh, a, a more improved or a higher uh, shear viscosity fluid as shown uh, by this study uh, with increasing concentration of the added polymer. Uh, here you can see that the nanoparticle modified VES system results in a more stable system at a higher temperature, and perhaps the uh, uh, presence of the nanoparticle improves their ability to form a thinner filter cake and also reduce fluid loss. Uh, the addition of essentially a inorganic nanoparticle results in a better micelle to micelle association. Uh, hence, the surface of the nanoparticle serves like an anchoring point uh, that allows you to uh, control the micelle stability. However, um, these particles can also serve as internal breakers. In other words, you can also decrease the stability of this micelle by acting directly on the dynamics of the nanoparticle. And uh, that means that uh, nanoparticles is just another a method together with the addition of polymers or change in the uh, counter ion design that allows you to control VES behavior. Uh, in this particular study, the addition of zinc oxide and magnesium oxide particles uh, over that of a fluid, a viscoelastic uh, 
surfactant fluid that doesn't have uh, this nanoparticle shows a higher apparent viscosity uh, in both cases. Okay, so I think I'm ready to summarize our talk uh, for today and leave more room for questions. In summary, VES are worm-like micelles that form at a higher concentration and a design packing geometry or parameter, uh, resulting in a viscoelastic surfactant or a higher viscosity liquid and can be stable and also reversible. Uh, I've also shown to you that they can be used for hydraulic fracturing, which can have advantages over polymers uh, in that uh, one can use simply dilution for breaking uh, the polymer, uh, the uh, surfactants as compared to polymers that can be residues. Uh, they have also been used for enhanced oil recovery uh, and it's an essential viscosifying media for the uh, oil field service uh, industry. Uh, and VS can also be stimuli responsive in the presence of pH, temperature, uh, light, uh, and even CO2. So with that, I'd like to thank you and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you, Dr. Vinculum. Um, I do not have any questions entered at this time. If anybody would like to ask a question, uh, please either raise your hand in the control panel and I will unmute your line. Or if you want, you can type it into the questions section and then I will be able to read that off. I'll just give you guys a moment to uh, see if there's any questions coming in. Okay, we do have one question that came in. Oh, actually a couple now. So um, I'll start at the top. From Stan, this is, it is very interesting that you have combined cationic and anionic surfactants together. Is this becoming more common? What were the benefits? And can he receive a copy of the slides? Uh, I believe the, uh, well, first of all, the uh, YouTube um, will be um, used, or in other words, this uh, presentation will be present in YouTube. And if you email me, be happy to correspond to you with regards to the slides. Uh, yes, the combination of a cationic and a uh, anionic surfactant uh, basically is the uh, stabilization or the change in geometry of the VES by changing the, or, or in the presence of a cold surfactant, take, changing the packing behavior. Typically, uh, uh, Zwitter ionic surfactant is also a good uh, um, surfactant without using this association behavior. Now, the reasons for doing this is sometimes the brine condition or the ionic strength uh, of the media can easily destabilize a surfactant. Uh, typically, a co-surfactant is a smaller surfactant or a smaller chain length uh, and not a surface active as the uh, uh, main surfactants. But in other words, uh, you have several choices. One is you can vary the co-surfactant or you can even use a Zwitter ionic surfactant to provide others added stability, uh, and let's say in environments with high salt concentrations. All right, I got one more question here. And let's see. In one of the slides, you put CA as the uh, cation. What are the other cations that are used? I'm not sure what that word was. C A T I O N? Yeah, C A T B or C I. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm not sure about the question, um, Richard. Uh, it could be uh, if our, our uh, uh, audience have the um, opportunity to rephrase that question. Uh, I did use several acronyms in the stock. Uh, uh, a lot of them refers to the uh, uh, surfactant that we actually use, like uh, CTAB, uh, uh, cet cetyl ammonium bromide, uh, cetyl uh, tri Tetra, uh, ethyl ammonium bromide, uh, these are commercial surfactants or SDS, sodium dodecyl sulfate, or DPPA, which is a lipid, okay? 
so it could be referring to that. Um, uh, so I'm sorry, I, the question is just not so clear for me to give. I'm going to attempt to unmute the line to see if he can uh, clarify the question for us. Uh, it looks like he doesn't have audio right now, though. Oh, here we go. Hi, can you hear us? Go on. Yeah, what I was asking is that in one of the slides, you put cation or uh, calcium as your cation. And the question is that uh, what other cations do they use for this particular uh, polymeric material? Okay, so calcium, of course, is a divalent cation, and that means mm -hmm. uh, we're trying to associate uh, uh, a higher um, valency cation with more uh, negative charges. So I, I mean, let's see, let's try to go back to that slide. Um, uh, there are Right, right. So this particular uh, diagram uh, shows that the uh, uh, pH or the concentration of calcium ion can result in a more stable VES uh, worm-like uh, micelle behavior. So without uh, showing the surfactants, because I, I should have put here the original uh, reference where this figure was scattered. So if the pH uh, was used, that simply means that you change the amphoteric nature of the surfactant, uh, either making it more anionic or cationic. So uh, it makes sense that this is a, uh, uh, at a higher pH, this will be an enhanced, um, uh, negative charge or at a lower pH, this will be an enhanced positive charge. The calcium here, uh, in this case, will refer to an interaction with a negatively charged surfactant. So the calcium ion tends to stabilize the uh, formation of this worm-like micelle by bringing together the two anionic head groups uh, to force them to form more cylinders. So again, I apologize, I don't have the exact structure of the surfactant, but that will be the action of the calcium ions when added to these uh, micelles. Thank you, that's good. All right, I don't see any other uh, questions out there, so I will go ahead and take the opportunity to ask uh, a final question here. And that is, um, can you give us a little bit of an a preview for next month's webinar topic, which is nanomaterials for flexible electronics. Uh, yes, Richard, this is uh, basically a review of uh, some of the um, nanomaterials, whether it be carbon nanotube or graphene or quantum dots uh, that can be used uh, for making devices or uh, nanoelectronics. Basically, um, there's a gamut of uh, uh, this uh, nanomaterials or molecules that have found their way in literature, but also in some practical device applications. So if you're interested in uh, what they, these individual nanoparticles do, whether they're enhanced conductivity, thermoelectric properties, or opto uh, electrical properties, uh, this would be a good opportunity to review. In our case, uh, we have synthesized a lot of organic electronic materials, uh, basically polymers and organic uh, materials that emit light. Uh, so they are useful for flexible and solid state devices as well. All right, thank you, doctor. Uh, please join us for that session on Wednesday, April 17th. So once again at noon, Eastern Daylight Time. And uh, thank you all for joining us for this session of the Park Systems 2019 Material Science Research and AFM webinar series. You can find more information uh, about Park Systems AFM at parksystems.com. And please direct any AFM questions that you have to inquiry at parksystems.com. If you have any questions specific to this webinar series, please feel free to reach out to me directly at richard at parksystems.com. And thank you all again, and we hope to see you next month. Have a good day. Thank you.